Right, okay. Um, so the data collected from these trials will usually be used in data analysis, and it will also be used as the basis for follow-on experiments. And in the end then, uh, usually you would uh, wrap this, this all up nicely in a publication. Now the, the danger with this obviously is if there are errors in the data in the data collection step, and these will propagate through to potentially the publication. So you might end up with wrong data in your publication. Obviously we don't want that. Now what do we do about that? Um, historically, there have been different ways of collecting phenotypic data. Uh, back in the day, uh, and some people still do that today, uh, you would have taken a piece of paper and a pen out into the field with the, the field plan printed on it, and then you would start just you know, noting things down. Now, there are some pros and cons to this. Um, the pros are that it is quite intuitive. You, know, you just need to write something down on a piece of paper, and most people will be familiar with it. It is also quite fast, just writing things down, but at the, at the same time, it's also slow, and that's because writing things down on paper isn't the whole story. You still need to sit down at a PC later on um, and type everything in, and you know, that's where you know, a lot of the mistakes can come in. Because not only when you write things down can you introduce mistakes like typos or number swaps, or you might write things in the, in the wrong column or row, but also when you then sit down at a PC, the same issues can happen again. So you might, you know, digitize the data in, in the wrong way. And that's all, um, you know, worsened by the fact that some people have got really bad handwriting. Uh, my handwriting is okay, but even even then, if you if I go back to notes that I've taken a few months ago, I might not be able to read what I've written. There's an example of an actual scoring sheet here. So this is something uh, that someone has been using to score some trials data. And I don't know about you, but I really can't read what it says. So, you know, handwriting is or can be a big issue. Now, the next step forward from this would be to get rid of the, the step where you just write things down. Uh, and intuitively, a lot of people would think that, you know, a spreadsheet or something like Excel might be a good idea to just type the data straight into that, because that gets rid of the, the step where you write things down. Now, again, there are some pros and cons here. Um, Excel or similar tools offer some basic data validation. So you can, you know, you can add rules where it highlights cells that are outside of a specific range or something like that. It also offers uh, generic data visualizations like your line charts and bar charts and stuff like that. A problem with uh, Excel and similar tools is that, especially on mobile devices with touch screens, the data input really isn't all that great. I don't know if you have used Excel on a, on a touch screen device, but let me tell you, it really isn't, isn't ideal for you know, entering large amounts of data. Um, additionally, there's no support for things like, you know, GPS tracking, image tagging, and barcode support. Which then leads me to the, the latest development in this area. That's, you know, the, these, these apps have been around for a few years now, and those are specifically designed apps for uh, phenotypic data collection out in the field. Now, they contain very specialized visualizations um, that are there to highlight patterns in the data, to highlight potential outliers. Uh, the apps are also designed to work well on mobile devices, but in, in the case of GridScore, they also work well on the desktop PC or your laptop. Um, they also have support for GPS tracking, image tagging, and barcode support. Um, uh, with, can people please mute? Or can you have a look at that, please? Um, the downside... <clears throat> The downside of, of these tools is that, you know, they might be unfamiliar to people, so there might be a, a learning curve initially. But that's exactly why, you know, we, we've got training like this, is to, to explain the tools to people so, you know, that people are, are more familiar with how they work. So the idea when we set out to develop this app was to, you know, take all the, the good things about the, the approaches that we've seen before with as few of the bad things. So the, the things that we wanted to achieve is to have the famili familiarity of the field plan. So we made the field plan like the central component of grid score because people like seeing the fit field plan in front of them. We also wanted to add um, advanced data validation so that when the data is entered, it is automatically checked whether it's in the specific ranges or whether it's one of the, the values that 
has been specified as a possible option for this trade. Um, and also with uh, you know just setting data types for each trade, we can check that they are of the correct type. Um, additionally, we wanted to make use of georeferencing mechanisms so that we can track where data has been recorded, but we can also show you where you are in the field layout. Um, then one requirement was to be able to take images and automatically associate them with the plot that you're, you're looking at uh, and the data that you're collecting. Um, then we wanted to have very specific data visualizations, again, for highlighting patterns and outliers in your data. And then, you know, it should work well on mobile devices and the barcode support should be there as well. So we took all these requirements and we sat down, we, we, we started developing the tool, which now uh, ended up being GridScore. Now here's some information about how you can install it. Uh, please note that for this training, you do not have to use GridScore. It's, it's all a demonstration, but feel free to, to install the app uh, later on. We will be sending these slides around. So this is basically how you install them. So on Android, there's a dedicated Android app that can be found in the Google Play Store. Um, and for all other devices like Windows, PCs, and laptops, Macs, iPhones, iPads, Linux, and even Android itself again, you can follow the link on the right hand side, which takes you to the to the website. Now the rest of this presentation is kind of split into these sections. Uh, so first of all, I will explain how you um, create a trial, because you know that's the thing that most people will be starting with. Then once it is set up, how you collect data with it. After that, once the data is collected, how you look at it. Um, and the last two sections are about some more advanced features that, you know, are kind of optional but very useful. And then at the very end, I will be talking about how you share that data with other collaborators or with other people collecting data in the same trial. So let's start with the, the trial setup, or more first of all, let's look at the user interface. So this is what GridScore looks like when you open it up the first time. Um, and I will quickly explain the different parts of this. So at the top, we've got the main navigation, which you can use to switch between the data collection and then various uh, data visualization options. If you are looking at GridScore on a mobile device or a smaller screen, these options are kind of hidden away in what's called a hamburger menu, which you can open up by clicking on the, the icon in the top right, which then reveals all the same options that we see here. In the top right, there is a toggle that you can use to switch between a dark and a light mode. Now, that can be useful in certain lighting conditions. So if you're working in a dark environment, you might be using, or you might want to use the dark mode because it's easier on the eyes. Uh, next to it, there's a switch where you can toggle different languages. So at the moment, GridScore supports English and German. But if there are volunteers who would like to translate GridScore into other languages, then we would be more than happy to include uh, those translations in GridScore because, you know, it just allows us to reach more people. Um, yeah, then these buttons here in the center, they are kind of like, you know, quick action buttons. So they will take you to some of the features of GridScore that are very useful when you first uh, load it up. So there are things like setting up a new trial, uh, importing data or loading one of the example data sets. So GridScore comes with two example data sets that you can open up just to, you know, have a look at how GridScore works. And then the last two option, uh, options are about, you know, how they are about explaining the user interface or helping you out if you're stuck. So there's an introductory tour that explains the trial setup. And then there's a help button that opens up the online help that's available for you to look at. Finally, once you've set up a few trials, you, you, can, have, trials. you can have multiple trials in, uh, in GridScore at the same time. These will show up here at the bottom, uh, so you can easily switch between them. So let's have a look at how we set up a new trial. Now, there are a few things that are required uh, for setting up a new trial. The first one is to give it a name, right? And that should be ideally a distinctive and descriptive name. So it should, you know, when you look at the trial name, it should be obvious what the trial is about. So we recommend including things like the year or the season, you know, the project acronym or something like that, and then a, a small description about the trial itself. 
Below that, um, you know, it's where you specify the field layouts, so you can define how many rows and columns there are. Now, Grisco assumes that the trial layout is at least fairly rectangular, so you know it's it's a tabular or grid-like layout with uh, rows and columns, and this is where you define how many there are of each. Uh, on the other hand side, there are the is, is where you define which traits you want to be scored and so which variables it is that you're measuring. To add a new trait, there's this text box down here um, where you can just type in a name and then click on the green button, which adds it to this list up here. Uh, in this case, I've already defined five traits. Uh, and let's have a quick look at what they are. So this is a barley trial. And for barley, there's a trait which is called heading which is basically just a time point where um, something in the barley plant happens. So what it is that we want to measure here is when that happens, which is why for the type of this trade, we have selected date. So what we are recording for each plot for this trade is a specific date. And the next two trades are numeric trades, uh, specifically floating point numbers, which means uh, that there are values, values like 5.7 or 12.78, something like that. Um, and these two have uh, a restriction put on them. And that's uh, one of the, the ways that we uh, utilize data uh, verification. In this case, we've only set a minimum because we know the plant height and the yield both have to be above zero because you know a negative value doesn't make any sense. We've not put a maximum on these two because we are not quite sure what the maximum plant height is going to be or what the maximum yield is going to be in this case. But if you know what these are, you can def define the maximum values as well. Uh, the next trait is slightly different to all the other ones. Um, it's also numeric, but it only uses a whole numbers like 7, 12, 13. Uh, and the trait is plants alive. So in this case, we want to count how many plants per plot are still alive. This is, a, this is a value between 0 and 30. So we're starting with 30 plants in each plot, and then we want to score how many are still alive. And this one uh, is what we termed a, a multi-measurement trait, which just means that this one, you want to measure multiple times throughout the season, just to see how you know the number of plants that are still alive changes over time. Because they all start out at 30, but you know as you progress through the season, some of the plants might be dying, so at the end you might only be left with 15 or 16 or something like that uh, in a plot. The other traits that I defined so far are only single measurements, which means we only record the heading once per plot, we only record the plant height once per plot, and the yield as well. Um, the last trait I've got here is uh, a categorical trait, just to, to show the, the, the other data type that's there. Uh, in this case, for barley, there are two different row types. Um, and there's a two row barley and there are, there are six row barleys. Uh, and these have been defined as the two options for this categorical trade. So when you're scoring the data, you can only pick one of the two. So the thing that's left to define is the actual information about the plots themselves. So which variety is growing or is being grown in, in which of the plots. To define that, you just click on that blue button there which takes you to the screen. This might look a bit overwhelming, but I'll just go through it step-by-step uh, step to explain what the, the individual bits do. So we've got three sections. It's the top left, top right, and the bottom. I'll start with the bottom. Um, and this is basically a representation of your, your field plan. So you've got your rows and your columns. Each one of these cells here is one of your plots. And what we ask you to define here are the the germplasm or variety identifier that you're going to be using, or that you know that identifies the variety. And if you choose to specify that, a rep number as well. Uh, the important thing to note here is that you, if you are you know growing the same variety multiple times, you have to specify the rep number so that we can differentiate between the different reps in the trial. Oh yeah. Um, Obviously, we don't want you to sit down and type these in manually into each of these text boxes you see down here, because there could be hundreds of them, uh, which is why we've got this section in the top right, where you can basically just copy and paste uh, the, the variety names or the rep numbers from something like Excel. So if you've got a spreadsheet like this with all the, the variety identifiers here and all the rep numbers there, 
in the same layout as the trial itself with your rows and your columns. You can just copy that from here, paste it into there, and then that will populate the table for you. So you don't actually have to go and type everything into grid score manually. And then in the top left, uh, this is just here for convenience, really. Uh, it's the row and the column numbers again. Because sometimes when you get to this screen, you might notice, oh, actually, I said I had seven columns, but actually I've got eight, or I've got them the wrong way around. You know, So you can just adjust them here easily, and the, the table below will update. So once you're done with, um, with all that, you just save that there which then completes the, the, the minimal information we need about the trial, which is the name, the, the layout, so the number of rows and columns, the trade definitions, and the plot information. There's some additional features down here, which I will highlight later on, uh, but for now, let's just leave it here because this was already quite a lot of information. So if you create the trial at this point, um, that's what it will look like. So again, you've got a tabular uh, display of your, your field layout with you know, the rows and the columns that you defined. Each of these boxes is one of your plots. We've got the identifier and the rep number, if it has been defined in here. And then there are five circles per plot. And these five circles represent the five traits that have been defined, which you can see in this drop-down box here. So you've got you know, heading, plant height, and all the other ones. The, um, the fact that they're empty at the moment means that we haven't recorded any data yet. So these circles will fill up over time as you collect data, and uh, that way they also kind of inter act as, um, you know, like a progress indicator. So the more filled circles you see, the more data has been collected. It also means you can quite easily see the empty circles, which indicate that the data still has to be collected for specific plots. Now, to record data, um, you basically you pick any of the plots, and by clicking on it, uh, you open the data input, uh, which, which looks like this. So here, we've got your identifier uh, at the top, just to make sure that you, you, know, you clicked on the right one. And then we've got, uh, for each trade, one data input. Now, depending on the type of trade or the data type that we chose, these will be slightly different. So for heading, for example, because we selected it to be a date, what we have here is a calendar dropdown. So you can select a calendar from, from this, this input, or you can use these buttons to set the date to today, or step backwards through time or forwards through time. In this case, we've selected the 12th, which, which was probably when I made this, this screenshot. Um, the, the next one is plant height. So this was a numeric value, which means that you can only enter numbers into this input. So it will not allow you to enter any text because you defined this to be a numeric trait. Uh, in this case, we just measured the height and we put that in here. The yield, now the yield is, is a trait that we're not gonna score yet because for barley, the yield is only measured once at the, the end of the season. We're, we're not there yet, so we can just leave that blank. Um, and then the next one was how many plants are still alive. Um, you know, because we, we selected this to be an inter or a whole number value, you've got these minus and plus buttons that you can use to adjust the value. But in, in this case, we're just going to set that to 30 because that's what we start with. And then the row type, you know, because it's categorical and we've got two options, we have two dedicated buttons for those options that you can pick from. Uh, and in this case, we've selected six row. Um, and then in addition to the trades, there are a few other things that you can record here. Um, so there's a, a comment text box where you can record any, any notes that you have. So if there's any, anything noteworthy that you see in the plot that you want, just want to keep a record of, you can just type that into this box. Um, in addition to that, there are these two buttons here for taking images and taking video, videos of the plot. And these will automatically be tagged with the, you know, the, the plot identifier, the timestamp, and the GPS coordinates. Uh, finally, there's this thing up here, which lets you bookmark specific plots. And that can be useful, for example, if you go out and you start scoring, but then you run out of time and you can't finish the whole trial. So you have to come back the next day. You can bookmark the plot you know, the, the one that you had to stop at. So next time you come back, you can just continue from there. 
Right, so if at the end we're done with the data input, we hit the save button and then the display changes. And we can see that some of the circles are filled now, uh, especially the, the, the first, the second, and the fifth, uh, because those were the single measurement traits that we, we scored. So there was only one value for, to record for each of them, and we've done that. So the circle is fully filled, which means we have scored those traits completely for this plot. This one here, the, the one in the middle, is yield. Now yield we haven't scored, so it's still empty. We're going to do that later on in the season. Plants alive is the blue one, and that is a half filled, and that's because it's a multi-trait. So that is a, is a trait that's going to be scored multiple times throughout the season. It's no longer empty because we have scored a value, but it's not full either because there might be more times that we come back to score this trait. As you go through this uh, through the trial, you know it'll lo look more and more like this. So you know more and more of the data uh, of the points will be filled, which you know just quickly or easily shows the the progress that you've made while you know scoring the data. Right. Um, so I, I mentioned that to select the tray the, the plot that you want to score, you can click on it. There are other ways of selecting the plot. Um, one is to use the barcoding feature, which I'll explain later. And the third one is to actually tell GridScore that it should guide you through the through the trial. Now to do that, you again you select one of the plots that you want to start from, which usually would be one of the corners, I would assume. Um, and then you can expand this guided walk section at the bottom, which gives you different options of you know which way you want to go. So if we started up here. Uh, I've selected this option, which goes right, down, left, down. And if we select that, what GridScore will do is it will guide us through the row to the end, down into the next row and back to the front, down into the third row and back across. So while you're scrolling, you don't actually have to select the plots individually. If you if you activate the guided walk, you just have to press the next button, and it will you know it will move you along to the to the next plot uh, in this in this order. Right, so now that we've collected a lot of data, let's look at some visualizations. Um, there is one visualization type which we've recently added, um, and it's specifically for multi-traits, so the ones that, ha that are being scored multiple times through the season. Uh, in this case, we're looking at Plants Alive, which was our multi-trait, and we have, <clears throat> we have selected four plots uh, from this selection here, which are then each represented with a line in this diagram. You can see they all start at 30 because we planted 30 plants in each plot. And as time progresses, you know, the number of plants that are still alive kind of decreases. Um, the gray area in the background is the whole value range. So that means that there are plots that still have more plants that are alive, which is the, the upper edge of this, uh, this area. But there are also a few where there are, there are only like 18 plants left alive. And you can visualize them all by selecting this option up here, which will show all the plots instead of the selection that we've made here. Um, another visualization that's quite useful are, are heat maps. Now, heat maps are very good at highlighting patterns uh, in your field layout. So this one uh, again is it's the you know the field layout with your rows and your columns, and each rectangle is one of your plots. In this case, we've selected a trait called on tipping, which is a date based trait. Uh, and it's color coded in a way that the plot where this happened later, uh, those plots are darker. Now, heat maps can highlight things like, for example, if you've got uh, an area of your, your trial that is waterlogged, it can show up in, in the phenotypic values. And you can see that you know, by a, you know, a blotch of, of values that are lighter or darker, uh, but also there are, um, this is an actual example from a trial, a barley trial here, it, it can highlight edge effects, which you see here, this, this column has got a lot darker values than the rest of the trial. Uh, and the assumption here was that that's because there's only one guard row on this side, which means these plants haven't been as well protected as the other ones. And heat maps are very good at highlighting these. Um, the, oops, one too far. Um, the other visualization we have are scatter plots. And scatter plots, I mean, everyone will be familiar with them. You select two traits in this case, 
and it will plot all the different values of those two trades against each other. In this case, on tipping and heading are related trades, so they will be time dependent, um, which is why you get a fairly linear correlation between these two. But these, these plots are, again, they're quite good at highlighting outliers. So if you had a data point up here, you could easily see that that falls outside of the, you know, the main data point distribution. So you could have a look at if that's a genuine data point or if, it's, that's, an, if that's an error in your data. Uh, and the last visualization we have are uh, box plots and bar charts. So for numeric trades, we can show these box plots, uh, which show the data distribution in this trade. In this case, plant height, there are five data points up here that are very, very, uh, so five varieties that are very, very tall. Now, these could be errors in the data, but they could be genuine data points, so which means that they're just unusually tall. And that's something that might be of interest, because sometimes you're looking for plants that are specifically tall or specifically uh, small, and you know these, these charts are quite good at highlighting those. Uh, for the categorical trades, you, you just get a histogram or like a bar chart rather uh, that shows the distribution of data points there as well. Okay, so once you're done with your scoring, you've looked at some visualizations, how do you get your data out of grid score? Now, there are several ways of doing this. Um, as you can see with the, the different tabs here, each of which represents a different export option. The, the the first one that's selected and the most straightforward one is just export it as a tab delimited file, which you can then copy and paste into Excel. Um, but you can also you know use this download button here, which then downloads it as a text file. Um, the data that's exported has got your plots along the side and the trades that were scored along the top, along with you know some GPS coordinates for you know where where that plot was. Um, but since we also develop a tool called Germinate, which is you know a plant genetic resources database, we've added a, a tab which exports data specifically in that format because we have these Germinate data templates that we use, which are Excel-based templates for the data upload. So we added a functionality to export straight into those templates. So again, you get your data in Excel format, but these are using specifically the, the Germinate data templates. Um, and once you've exported this, you can drag and drop them straight into, into Germinate for upload. Um, a few weeks ago, we added this other option down here, which will export the, the trial layout into what's called a shapefile. Um, for that to work, you have to define the corner points of the field. Um, and then based on the row and the column number that was defined, it will you know, generate this, this shapefile basically. Um, that tells you what the shape of the individual pot, plots were. If you take those two together, what you can do once you imported that into Germinate is again visualize that data in a, in a similar fashion to grid score, but more advanced. So you can look at you know heat maps uh, drawn directly onto a map. Uh, you can select plots in here and then look at their their uh, you know the change over time for these specific plots that you selected. And that's all available by just exporting the data from GridScore and uploading that to Germinate. Right, so that, that was like the main functionality that Germinate offers, uh, not Germinate, GridScore, sorry. Uh, there are other functionalities that are a bit more advanced uh, that I'll talk about now. Um, one of which was one of the requirements that I mentioned initially is that it should support barcodes. And barcodes can be used for multiple um, purposes. Uh, and they are quite good because they reduce, again, they reduce the error rate because scanning a barcode, there's less that can go wrong than if you type data in or if you write something down. Uh, and we use them for two purposes. One is for the identification of the plot. So if you remember, I told you, you can identify the plot that you want to score by clicking on it or by using the guided walk. And the third option is to use a barcode. If you have barcodes in your trials, you know, so uh, attached to the plant or a stake in the ground or something like that, and that has the, the identifier in, in it, you can scan that barcode and that will open the, the data input for the plot that you're looking at. So you don't have to select it from the main overview, you, you just scan the barcode and that opens up the data input and then you can you can add your data there. 
The other way this can be used is for actual data input as well. So this is an example of a body trial at the, the James Hutton Institute, uh, where we've got a barcoded measuring stick. Now this works because it's got a different barcode at each half centimeter. And what uh, our field staff do is they, they take them out into the field with a barcode scanner, they hold them next to the plant, and then they just scan the barcode at the appropriate height. And that will straight away add that data to grid score. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot less error prone and it's fast as well, because, you know, scanning a barcode, if you know, if you will know this from a supermarket or something like that, it's just really quick. Um, one other thing that we can do, um, if you have to find the corner points of the trial, um, we can show you where you are inside the trial. So as you move through the trial, this, this pointer will appear and it will show you your position within the trial. That can be quite useful, you know, just for figuring out where you are and where you need to go next. Um, and it also shows your position on a map as well as you move along. Um, something else that we've added recently are what's called trial markers. And you see an example down here. So that's this wooden marker there, as well as these, these stakes in the background. And they are there for people in the field for, for easier orientation. So you will have them every two rows or every five rows or so, so that you just know where you are. If you have those in your trial setup, you can define them in grid score as well. So you can say, I've got a marker every five rows in this example and every four columns, which, you know, results in, in a positioning like this. And they will then show up in the data view here. So you see these gray markers there and there. And they are they're also, you know, they're, they're just there for better orientation. It makes it easier to navigate through the trial. Um, one other thing that I mentioned is photo tagging. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with this. If you take a digital camera out into the field, you take lots and lots of pictures, you come back and you look at the, the SD card or whatever. And you've got a bunch of files that are just called p something something dot jpeg now that's not very useful because which variety is is as a that we see in this picture which variety was that one it just you know it, it's a it's a lot of effort to then go through those images individually and relate them back to the data uh, if you take the images with grid score uh, through the feature that I, I mentioned earlier they will automatically be tagged with the timestamp the plot identifier and the gps position so what you get instead is something like this. So a file name with the date in it, the time and uh, the variety identifier, uh, but also the GPS coordinates will be added to the metadata. So they are also available in the image. Uh, one other thing is we've been working with some voice synthesis and voice recognition. Um, and you might remember the the, the comments box that I mentioned earlier. So for each plot, you've got a comments box below the traits where you can just write things down that you noticed. What you can also do is just press the button next to that text box and just speak into your phone and the phone will transcribe that into text or it will at least, at least do its best to transcribe that into text. Additionally, the other way around though is that we added voice feedback. And that's particularly useful if you know if you're using barcodes, but in other situations as well, because it will just repeat whatever it is that you're doing uh, audibly. So if you select a plot, it will speak the name or the identifier of the plot, so you can hear it. But also, if you uh, if you enter data for a specific trait, it will also read that out, so you can hear. And that's another verification step because if you hear it back, you can make sure that the data that you entered is actually what you wanted to enter. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is how you share the data with other collaborators. So it might be that you've got two people going out into the field scoring the same trial. It might be that you just want to send the data to someone else. And that's all facilitated with, uh, you know, the use of a QR code. So once you want to share the data, you can generate a QR code in GridScore. You can send that to someone else and they scan that same QR code and then they will have access to exactly the same data as you. And those devices will then be linked as well. So if you synchronize the data, the data will be available on the other device. And to explain that a bit better, I tried to, visualize, to, to make this diagram that hopefully will explain it. I'm not sure, it might just confuse people, but let's give it a go. 
So let's say we've got three people. There's Alice, Bob, and Claire. Alice is the PI of the project, so she decided to set up the trial, but she's not going to bother with any of the data collection because she's got Bob and Claire to do that. So she will set up the, the trial on her PC because it, you know, it's more convenient to do that on the PC rather than the phone. And then she will share that with the grid score server, which generates the QR code that she then sends to Bob and Claire. And they scan that QR code, which then loads that data onto their phones. And they use their phones in the field to collect the data. Now, Bob uh, collects data every day and he synchronizes it at the end of every day, whereas Claire uh, goes out into the field every three days or so and then synchronizes the data. Where it gets interesting is this point here. So, Bob collected some data and Claire isn't aware of that until this point here. Because when Claire goes out, she collects some data and synchronizes. The server will tell her, look, Bob also collected data, and, and here is the latest data. So it will synchronize and combine the data from Bob and Claire and merge it together so that she then also has Bob's data. When Bob then synchronizes next time, the server will tell Bob, look, Claire synchronized data, here it is, you know, so that everyone has got the same data at this point. And then at the end of the project, Alice gets involved again. Uh, and she thinks, well, I should probably have a look at this trial. She synchronizes, and then she gets all the data that Bob and Claire collected. So once you share that QR code, it's, it's really as easy as pressing a button to synchronize the data between the devices. Oop, that was too far. Yeah. Um, so to come to a bit of a conclusion, um, so Gritsco is completely free and open source. Um, here's the link again, but we'll send the slides around as well. If you have got any questions at any point, you can ask them, you know, after this talk. But also, if you have got questions later on, send me an email, you know, send, you know, contact me on Twitter, whatever. Uh, please get in touch. We're more than happy to help. Uh, to summarize, um, the you know the accurate data collection is extremely important because you know your research to to a certain degree depends on it. If you have inaccurate data, you know you're going to publish inaccurate data. Um, and GridScore, the tool that I in introduced, is a new phenotyping app with lots of interesting and helpful features. We, we hope you're going to try it out, and we're more than happy to get you set up and running. Uh, if you've got any issues or anything, we, we, we're going to help you with that. Um, I'm going to try and show a video now. Please let me know if you cannot hear the sound, because then I'm just going to stop, stop and skip it, but I'm just going to set it to play now. Well, I can't hear the sound, so I'm going to assume you can't hear it either. No, okay. Well, let's skip that for now. We're going to send the slides around so you can look at the video. Uh, the, and there's also a link here to YouTube. Um, just a bit of an acknowledgement. You know, we've used a lot of free and open source software. You know, all of the, the ones here. Uh, we just wanted to, you know, give them some acknowledgement. Uh, but then the people who are involved were uh, lots of people from the James Hutton Institute, which you see here. Um, and then obviously all our funders as well, you know, a whole bunch of, of institutions that have supported us over the years and, you know, who have influenced us during the development of, of Gritscra. And with that, I come to the end of the presentation.